Good morning. Good morning. Welcome uh, to those of you who are here in person and those that worship with us over the internet. Welcome you to, uh, to the service. And may this separation in space not compromise our reverence to honor our Lord and to be with him this morning and worship him. Uh, for this morning, I want to read a uh, passage from the Bible. This is uh, Psalm 84. Uh, someone alert brought that to me, uh, to my attention. And as I reread and reread, it turns out that this is a very inspiring message about worship. This is a psalm of worship. And as I read to you, please focus on the part on the fact that this writer really, really long has a deep longing for worshiping God in his house. And the blessing that he saw, even though the journey to Jerusalem to worship may be arid, uninteresting, it seems, or even challenging, maybe, but because of his longing to, to worship the Lord in his house, it turned out to be a refreshing spring collection of blessing, even though it doesn't seem that way. So please rise as I read from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, body and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home there and the swallow builds her nest and raises her young in a place near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my King and my God, how happy are those who can live in your house always singing your praises. Happy are those who are strong in the Lord, who set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. When they walk through the valley of, of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs where pools of blessings collect after the rains. They will continue to grow stronger, and each of them will appear before God in Jerusalem. Verse 10, a single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a keeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. For the Lord God is our light and protector. He gives us grace and glory. No good thing will the Lord withhold from those who do what is right. O Lord Almighty, happy are those who trust in you. This is the word of God. Shall we pray? Father, indeed, this morning is such a privilege for us. Even in this troubled world, this fallen world, with all the distractions and the uh, things that we have to worry about and fret on a daily basis, and yet you told us that there's nothing, nothing that can separate us from your love. And this morning we come to you to worship you, to give you the honor that you deserve, to ask for you continue to help us to be firmly planted in our faith, that we enjoy, we have a life of peace. Even though our, the believer, the Savior, those that are saved by the grace of God, of Jesus Christ, that we encounter the same things unbelievers do. We have the same environment threatening us and the dangers and the disease and so on, but because of your grace, because of your love, we look at life from a different perspective and we have peace, as you said, that this world cannot give. So as we worship together this morning, we ask that the Spirit help us to Look at, to hear the words of the psalmist and we resonate, our heart resonate with him with a deep and true longing to worship you in your house and the gratitude that we give you because you allow us to do so. May you bless those who are here and those who are worshiped over the, over the airwaves that nothing can compromise our reference to you. Be with us, Lord, as we sing, as we share our message, as we pray, you are here with us. That everything, everything, every honor is yours. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Nice to uh, worship together. You 
days, I have privilege to go to uh, Red Rock Canyon, and I see those majestic mountains, red. I said, well, who make those? And uh, you know, the answer is our awesome God. Let's all rise and say awesome God. <laughs> Is an awesome God he reigns from heaven above with ways to hum power and love our God is an awesome God our God is an awesome God he reigns from heaven above Awesome God, He reigns from heaven above with with some power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with with some power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Okay, let's bow our head and close our eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for giving us Jesus. Jesus, we believe you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross to rescue us from sins and death, to restore us to the Father. We chose now to turn from our sins, our self-centeredness, and every part of our life that does not please you. We choose you. We give our life ourselves to you we, re we receive your forgiveness and ask you take your rightful place in our life as our Savior and Lord. Jesus, our irreplaceable Savior, restore us. Jesus, live in us. Love through us here and with the people at home worshiping you today. Thank you, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name.
Good morning. I'll be reading from John chapter 1, verse 1 to 18. Let's take a moment to open our Bibles to this chapter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And a man sent him, whose name was John. He came as a witness, to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks above me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received, grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. This is the word of God. I was saying earlier, um, up in the mountains, deserts, uh, mountains, I was hoping to see a deer uh, because, uh, you know, it'd be nice in a while and see a deer. Instead, we find a squirrel. Uh, uh, I, I guess it's like a whole family of squirrels, like three or four of them. I said, how would the squirrel be there? Where they can find water? But actually, uh, there's a little description on the plaque and said, Squirrel can find water, and as a deer can find water. It's all right and say, as a deer. <coughs> as a deer panted for the water, so my soul on the deep. You Thank you. 
brother, even though you are a king, I love you more than any other, so much more than anything. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit. Silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of all my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone, me, my spirit. Good morning, everyone. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food from your holy word. That's what we pray for now, God. We want you to speak. We do not want to hear the words, the creativity, the thoughts of a man. We want to hear your word. We want to hear your voice. We want to hear you speak. So Lord, we pray for that now. We pray for your word to go forth. We pray for your power through your word to be felt in the way our lives are shaped according to you, your will for us. We pray for that now, God. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This morning we are back in Exodus chapter 33. As I studied this passage, to prepare for the sermon this week, I grew, to, I grew to deeply appreciate Moses. We know that Moses is a great man. We know that Moses, a lot of great things happened through him. But through studying this passage this week, I came to deeply appreciate him more. If I was an Israelite living during the time of Exodus 33, and I knew about Moses, and I knew about what I see in this passage about Moses, I would be thinking to myself, I'm so thankful that we have him. I'm so thankful that we have Moses with us. We are here in the wilderness, but we have him here with us. I'm so thankful that we have Moses here with us. He is not only here with me, but he is here for me. Well, brothers and sisters, I have great news for us today. Hebrews 3 teaches us that we have someone who's even greater than Moses. Christ is greater than Moses, eternally greater than Moses. And we have Christ. And through this passage this week in Exodus chapter 33, I hope that these truths will become much more relevant and much more evident for us. So for this sermon today, this passage today, I have three points to guide us through. So if you are a note taker, these three points will help guide us through our time today. Point number one, 
talks about this, having a place to hear from God. Having a place to hear from God. Point number two. Oh, also this, having a mediator so near to God. Having a mediator so near to God. He is so near to him. And finally, number three, having a mediator so committed to his people. Having a mediator so committed, so committed to his people. That's the way Moses was. He was so near to God, but he was also this. He was so committed to them, to his people. <laughs> Excuse me. All right, so that's where we're going today, those three parts. So let's begin with the first point, having a place to hear from God. And we find this in verses 7 to 11. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me there to Exodus chapter 33, verse 7. And we're going to read first to verse 11. Exodus 33, 7 to 11. Exodus is all the way in the real front of your Bible. Genesis is before it, and then it's Exodus, the second book. Now, Exodus chapter 33, 7. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak to Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up, rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. This is God's word. Now, some people, when they read verses 7 to 11, would ask the question, why is this here? People would say this is a very weird inclusion of a passage. They would ask, why is verses 7 to 11 here in Exodus chapter 33? The reason why they will ask that question is because if you remember last week, verses 1 to 6, it's about God withdrawing his presence from his people. His people had so much sin in their midst, and God is such a holy God that God removed his presence from the midst of the people of Israel. That's verses 1 to 6. If we jump forward to verses 12 to 17, it's Moses the mediator pleading to God to renew his presence with his people. So 1 to 6, God withdrawing his presence. Verses 12 to 17 is Moses pleading for Israel that God will re-give them his presence. It's about the presence of God, lost and prayed for to be renewed. Now, the question is this, why 7011? 7011 is about a tent. It's about a tent. Not even the tabernacle. Not the temple of God, just a tent. A temporary tent put up and taken down. A, a tent. Why is this passage here, verses 1711, about a tent? And why is it shoved right in the middle of a passage, wider passage, about God's presence? As many people read this passage and say, this is a weird inclusion. Why is this here? Imagine a parent hearing a, child, a baby speak for the first time holding the baby in their arms. And for the first time ever, you hear this baby speak. Who cares about the grammar? Who cares about the content? The baby is speaking. Oh, how precious it is that the baby is speaking. Here in this passage, we see the preciousness of God speaking. 
we see how precious it is when God Almighty speaks to his people. The preciousness of God speaking. And here we find the point, having a place, a place to hear from God. And why is this passage here, verse 1711, about a tent? It has everything to do with what happened here in this tent. Look with me at verse 9. What happened in this tent? Verse 9, when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would what? The Lord would speak with Moses. Look with me at verse 11. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. It has everything to do with what happened in this tent. This tent was a place where God spoke to his people. Oh, the preciousness of God speaking. And here was a place, a place, though Israel was separated from God, God's presence was withdrawn from Israel. God was separated from his people, and yet God still gave him a place simply for the purpose of hearing God speak. The preciousness of God speaking. Here was a place simply, simply for the purpose of hearing their God speak. God's voice, hearing from God. Now, what do we do with this, brothers and sisters? Let me ask us, friends, how precious is our Bible? How precious is that Bible that you're holding in your hands? Even if it is just on a cell phone, the content, how precious is the Bible? Why? We have a place that we can always go to to hear our God speak. We have a place simply for the purpose of hearing God speak that we can always go to. Every time we open our Bibles, that is a place simply for the purpose of God speaking to us, hearing God speak. That song, speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive food from your holy word. Uh, when I was in Hawaii, when we were in Hawaii, uh, you guys know I always like to come up with phrases to remind us about what is happening when we hear the scripture read. Sometimes I'll say, this is the word of God. Sometimes I'll he say, this is the very word of God. Sometimes I'll say, listen, this is the voice of God speaking to us. I always come up with, with, with ways to remind us what is happening when scripture is read. Uh, we were at a church in Hawaii, and this lady went up to do scripture reading. And after she read, very plain, very simple, this is what the Lord has spoken. That's true. That's true. You guys know, and sometimes when you read the Gospels, you find certain words in red. Why are those words in red? Well, it's because those are Jesus' words. The, whoever translated that version of the Bible wanted to make sure you knew there's many words in the Gospels, but if you see these red words, these are Jesus' words. I'll pay attention. These are Jesus' words. Don't let that distract us from what all Scripture is. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture, all of it, every last word of it, even those ones that we barely read about in those in-between those in -between books in the Bible, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. How much of scripture is God's word? It says all scripture, every single jot and tittle of it. Second Peter 1.21, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God. Listen to it one more time. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. All scripture breathed out by God. No scripture, no prophecy by the will of man. Men spoke from God. Simply put, in the Bible, we have a place that we can always go to. Praise God for that. For simply for the purpose of hearing our God speak. What a precious thing it is that we have it. Listen to what Augustine said great theologian of the past. When the Bible speaks, simply, 
God speaks. John Piper, do you want to hear God speak? I want to hear God speak. What is God saying? I want to hear the voice of God. Do you want to hear God speak? Read the Bible out loud. Alistair Begg, another good pastor and preacher, said this, when the word of God is truly taught, the voice of God is truly heard. Oh, how precious it is when the Bible is opened. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon says this, to me, the Bible is not God, but it is God's voice, and I do not hear it without awe. Oh, how guilty we are often of hearing passage of scripture read and we yawn. How guilty we are, how shameful it is that so often we hear a passage of scripture read and our mind wanders to something else in life. Spurgeon says to me, the Bible is God's voice and I do not hear God's voice without awe. Listen to the psalmist in Psalm 119, 102. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Simply put, having a place to hear from God. Having a place to hear from God. That's point number one. But God is so good to his people, even though God separate, was separate from his people, withdrew his presence from his people, God not only gave them a place to keep hearing from God, God also gave them this. Point number two, having a mediator who is so near to God. God gave him a person, a priest, a mediator who is so near to God. Now, uh, I don't know if you guys have met my parents. You guys know I talk about my parents quite a bit. Uh, again, the older I get, the more I appreciate them. Uh, my parents are so close to one another. Uh, they are so close in relationship, so close uh, in distance because they're always uh, together, doing stuff together. They are so close to each other that if I ever wanted to find out where my mom was, what do I do? I go to my dad. I call my dad. Hey, where's mom? If I ever wanted to know where my mom, where my dad was, what do I do? I call my, my mom. Hey, where's dad? Because they are so close to one another, so near to one another, that if I wanted to go to one, all I have to do is go to the other one. Through this one, I'll know. I'll be able to access that one. Israel was separated from God, but Israel had one, a prophet, a priest, a mediator who was so near to God, so near to God, that if they had him, they had access to him. Notice with me in verse 7, and notice the strong contrast. Verse 7 now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it where? Outside the camp. The camp was where Israel was. The tent was pitched outside the camp, removed from them, outside of their midst. Going on to verse 7, far off from the camp, not just outside of it, but far away from the camp. He called it the tent of meeting and everyone who sought the Lord would go out away from the people out to the tent of meeting which was outside the camp notice the emphasis in that verse God was a God who was removed from his people outside of the camp now notice the contrast in verse 11 if God was so removed from Israel what about God and Moses look at verse 11 thus the Lord used to speak to Moses how face to face as a man speaks to his friend notice the contrast notice the contrast of this passage God was far removed outside far from the people of Israel but when it came to God and Moses it was face to face 
as a man as a man speaks to his friend. It was as far removed from Israel, so God was so close, so near to Moses. Moses was so near to God. When it says face to face in verse 11, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face. It does not mean literally that Moses used to see the face of God physically. We know later on in verse 20 of this chapter that man cannot see the face of God and live because God is a holy God. What it meant when it says that the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face was not literally seeing God's face, but it was face to face. It meant direct communication. It meant that Moses had such nearness to God, such direct communication, speaking to God and hearing from God. It was as if he was speaking straight to God face to face. This was about the nearness of Moses to God. This was about the relationship of Moses to God. As if he was speaking straight to God face-to-face, direct communication, speaking to God, hearing from God. And notice it goes on in verse 11, as a man speaks to his friend. Oh, imagine being a friend of God. God used to treat Moses and speak to Moses as a friend. A friend of God. In other words, as we look at this passage, and again, I remind us about our point, which is having a mediator who is so near to God. If I was there in Israel, oh, God is removed from us, but oh, we have him. We have a mediator who is so near to God, and through him, we have him. Through him, we have access to him. Those separated from God, they had a mediator who was so near to God, able to go straight to God face to face and plead for me before God. Pray for me before God. Represent me before God. Though I am removed from God, I have him who pleads for me before God. You guys remember that song? One of the greatest lyrics ever written, in my opinion. Before the throne of God above, face to face with God, O Christ, we have a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and what? And pleads for me. Hebrews 3, Christ is greater than Moses. We have Christ. We have a mediator who is so near to God. Listen to this. Christ is greater than Moses. Even though here Moses was so near to God, being a friend of God, we have Christ. Those of us who are Christians, who have placed our trust in Christ, we have Christ, who is not only a friend of God, Oh, how much more near could one be to God? For Christ himself is the son of God. If the friend of God is so near to God, able to access God straight to God, how much more near do we have this mediator who is so much more near because he is the son of God? What this means is this. Every time I sin, every time that I am selfish, Every time that I am angered sinfully, every time that I am lustful or proud, every time I sin and I know the depth of my sin, and in my heart, I mourn my sin, my sin, my sin, I know my sin, I feel the weight, the guilt of my sin, my sin, my sin. Every time that happens, every time that happens, Christ is right there at the right hand of God, face to face before the throne of God. Christ is right right there pleading for me, my blood, my blood, my blood before God. Every time I sin, my sin, my sin, Christ is right there, my blood, my blood, my blood. And as long as Christ is there, I'm okay. As long as he is there pleading for me, 
I'm okay. As long as he is there, because he is so near to God, pleading for me. And that's what we find here in point number two. Israel, though separated from God, they had a mediator who was so near, so near to God, face to face with God, pleading for them. And we see how Moses pled for them. We see this, this, this one who interceded for them. Though God was separated, Moses pled for them face to face with God. And we find that in the third point of our sermon today. And this is how we'll finish. Not only was he, Moses, a mediator who was so near to God, he was a mediator who was so committed, so committed to his people, to his people, so committed, so devoted, so for them, so near to God, so for his people, so that he used his position so near to God for the sake of his people. And we find that in verses 12 to 17, having a mediator so committed to his people. Look with me there, Exodus chapter 33, verse 12 to 17. <clears throat> Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said... I know you by name. You have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. 14, and he said, my presence will go with you. I will give you rest. That was God speaking to Moses. I will be with you, Moses. Verse 15, and he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, who I and your people, is it not your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do for them. Why? For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Because of you, I will be with them. Because of you, Moses, so pleasing to me, so near to me, because of you and your pleading for them, I will go with them. Do you see what's happening here in 12 to 17? Moses was so near to God, but Moses was so committed to his people. We see this especially in verses 14 and 15. Notice in this passage, God already said to Moses, my presence will go with you, Moses. I will give you rest, Moses, you, you, singular. But Moses doesn't give up. Moses does not stop. 15, he said to him, if your presence will not go with me or us, plural, if you're using NIV. Do not bring us up from here. Notice, notice how he's changing from, no, not me, not me, us, us, God. God already said, my presence will go with you. I will give you rest. I will be with you, Moses. But Moses keeps going. He will not stop pleading until it's us, us. For how shall it be known? I have found favor in your sight. I and your people. Is it not your going with us that we are distinct? I and your people. 
Moses, Moses will not stop until it's us, until that singular you, Moses, becomes us, I and your people. It's kind of like uh, when you watch a movie and uh, there's a burning building and there's a person trapped in the building and the person says to another person, go, go, get out of here, go on without me. And what does that other person always say? All right, see you later. No, the other person always says, no, I will not go. I will not go without you. I will not go until I have you, until you go with me. That's what's happening here. God is saying, I will go with you, Moses. I will give you rest in the land. But Moses says, no, I will not go until it's us, until it's I and your people. You see how good it is for Israel to have Moses. Oh, how good it is, though God was separated from his people, far off from them, far off removed from them. They had a mediator who was so near to God, but not only so near, so committed to them. I will not go until it's us. I will not go without them. The one who was face to face with God was the one who face to face face with God will not will not stop pleading to God for them because he was so committed to them. Oh, Israel had a mediator who was so committed to them, to his people. Where did Moses get this from? Why was Moses this way? Let me ask you this question for the Bible nerds. What was Moses' job before this exodus? For many years, what was his job in the land of Midian? Uh, one of my college jobs back then was I worked, I was a warehouse worker. It was uh, pretty fun because, you know, you spend all your time studying, but it was fun to be able to do a job where you just lift boxes and, 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 and do a lot of grunt work. What was Moses' job before Exodus, this Exodus? He was a shepherd. Many years, many years, decades. He was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd, and from what we see here, he must have been a good shepherd. He must have been a very good shepherd. When it came to his flock, when it came to his flock, the flock of sheep that he was entrusted overseeing, I will not stop. I will not stop shepherding and working until my flock makes it to the land. Green pasture makes it home. I will not stop until I bring my flock to the land. Now, this flock, this people, the land, the land. Here we find Moses with such a shepherding heart. I will not stop until I bring them. I don't want to go home. I don't want to go there alone. I don't want to go there by myself with empty hands. I don't want to make it back without them. I will not stop until I know that this flock will make it and God will bless them and God will be with them all the way to the land of green pastures. Moses was a shepherd. He was a good shepherd and he showed his shepherding here. But again, Christ is better than Moses. If I was in Exodus 33, I would go, oh, oh, I'm so thankful that we have Moses. Oh, but how much better we have Christ. How much better that we have Christ, who is not only a shepherd, he is the good shepherd. Psalm 23, that well-known passage, remember how the passage ends, the very last part of the passage. It says, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Notice the confidence of the psalmist saying, I shall, not I hope, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How is he so sure that he shall forever dwell in the house of the Lord? Well, the verse, the first part of the verse, because the Lord is my shepherd. We also have a mediator, Christ himself, who is also the good shepherd, who is so near to God, so near to God, the son of God, and he will not stop shepherding us. He will not stop pleading for us and working for us until he gets his flock into the land. He will not stop. He will not stop pleading for you until you make it into the land. Listen to John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep, my sheep, notice the possession, mine. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. This is about security. This is what it means to belong to him. When Jesus says, these are mine, my sheep, if you, Christian, repent of your sins and trusted in Christ, you now belong to Christ. Christ says, you are mine. And Christ is a good shepherd. Christ is the one who is so near to God. But Christ is also the one who is so committed to you, his sheep, that he will not stop until he makes sure that he gets you into the promised land. He says, they, my sheep, will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. This is security. This is what it means for him to be our savior. This is what it means when we say, Christ saves, Christ saves to the uttermost. He ever lives and pleads for us. So what do we find here again in Exodus chapter 33? We find a, having a place, those separated from God, far off from God, God was still good to them. Having a place to hear from God. Having a mediator so near to God, Finally, having a mediator so committed to his people. Let's pray. Lord, we see in this passage your goodness to sinners in providing for our needs. Thank you, Lord, that you have always been a God of grace and kindness. But Lord, we know that your kindness has been shown ultimately through the giving of your son who was God with us. Though you were removed from us in our sin, you sent your son to be with us that he might bring us to you. So Lord, we pray that our love for Christ will increase. We pray that our trust in Christ will be strengthened. And we pray, Father, that we might be a people who live for Christ and proclaim the saving message of the saving Christ to many. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Pastor Alex, that uh, <coughs> remind us there's a place to hear from God. A mediator so near and so committed to God. So because we have Jesus, because the power of God's love. Let's all rise and sing. 
I come to you, let my heart be changed, renew, flowing from the grave that I found in you. Lord, I've come to know the weaknesses I see. Will be stripped away by the power of your love. Hold me close, let your love surround me. Bring me near, draw me to your side. So with you, your spirit leads me on in the power of your love. Lord, unveil my eyes, let me see you face to face, the knowledge of your love. Surround me, bring me near, draw me to your side. And as I wait, I rise up like the eagle. I will soar with you. Your spirit leads me on. The power of your love. Hold me close, let your love surround me. Bring me near, draw me to your side. So with you, your spirit leads me on in the power of your love. I will so with you, your spirit leads me on in the power of your Again, uh, praise the Lord that we can uh, worship together. You know, normally at this time we want to step down and get closer to you folks and welcome and announcement and so on. But so, some of you might have read a passage in the news that there was an elementary school teacher in the Bay Area, and uh, she was she wore a mask, and uh, but she wanted to read clearly to the students, so she took her mask off and then uh, start reading. It turned out that 80% of the front row got infected. 
she was not she was not uh, vaccinated, and maybe she knew she had the the virus or she didn't. But then that transmission kind of kind of uh, uh, sort of expanded to 29 people. Pick kids, bring it home. So I'm going to stay here, okay? But remember, you know, be safe, okay? Well, our service, uh, the worship service, does not include uh, does not conclude because part of it is the our tithe and offering that we bring to uh, to to Him. And I want to praise the Lord that uh, uh, our brothers and sisters are very faithful. So, so I uh, praise the Lord for that. And I want to just remind you this part of the service, of worship, which is the tithes and offering. And uh, there are news, some announcements, a few announcements. Uh, we have prayer meeting at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, you uh, uh, keep that in mind if you can. Please join us that we pray together for the worship service and also for our, our body of Christ and also for uh, the, the, the environment we live in and, and bring it uh, and uh, intercede for them uh, in our prayer. And then there was Sunday school at 11 o'clock, about half an hour from now. And also the pastor have the sermon schedule for, for let's say a quarter, and I'm sure he, he's gonna be up, he's gonna update it so please pay attention to you know what to expect uh, in terms of uh, the message he's going to share for September and on, okay? And uh, so the rest of the uh, prayer, uh, prayer requests and so on are in the bulletin. So, uh, Pastor, Benedict. All right, well, as you... Uh invite you to stick around for study of Acts for Sunday school. Uh, with that said, let's all stand for the benediction as we close our time this morning. Be reminded of the goodness of our God who keeps us to the very end. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. Please have a seat for a time of silence and reflection. <laughs>